From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. TikTok wants your face and your voice prints. Ransomware backup providers are paying ransom to ransomware attackers. Now, these are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we're going to get a chance for some insight, some opinion and some expertise on these stories and more from our guest who this week is Robert Wood, who is CISO at the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. Wish I had that kind of uh, welcome when I walk into the living room. So. Appreciate well, we have a, high, a highly trained studio audience, but they are, they're available to be rented out. So uh, welcome to the show. Our sponsor for this week is Trend Micro. I'll be speaking about them shortly as well. And for people who are joining us, uh, join us on Crowdcast, because there you can actually share some of your comments. And if we have the time, we will indeed address those as well. So we have 20 minutes to come through some of the stories that we've been covering on the daily podcast, Cybersecurity Headlines. The first one that I want to bring up here is uh, Exagrid. Now, Exagrid is a company that uh, provides uh, backup uh, technology uh, in preparation for these kinds of things. And they themselves were hit uh, with ransomware. They paid this back on May 13th. The problem with this was uh, as they were negotiating and dealing with this, they actually lost the decryption key and had to ask for it back. And I'm not intending by any means to make fun of them for doing that, of course. Um, But this was, uh, once again, a high-stress situation where a lot of data, personal data of clients, commercial contracts, NDA forms, financial data was all left out there. So they were negotiating this down and they had some problems getting back up. So I would like to ask you, Robert, you know, can we discuss this panic factor as we're talking about the physical preparation for breaches and vulnerabilities? We've got this human element of of, uh, dealing with a crisis from a panic side point, the emotional side point. Is this something that you have encountered or prepared for in your own particular uh, area of expertise? Yeah, I think it's pretty prevalent in when when you're trying to respond to to a high profile, high stress incident, and you know there's this inherent um, uh, it's it's like an unspoken metric that that speed of recovery is is super super important, and uh, and it, and it sort of it 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 stands to reason that if you're moving really really fast and you're just you're you're scrambling to try to do something that you might you might make mistakes. And if you make a mistake in, in such a situation, it could be, uh, you know, the impact of that mistake might be much larger than, uh, uh, than if you're just doing a, you know, your day-to-day job. And, uh, you know, I, I love this, <clears throat> uh, this, this saying that's used a lot in the military, that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And, uh, you know, if you're going sort of uh, slowly and methodically and intentionally, but making sure that everything is right, and if the process is smoothly carried out, that ultimately it's going to be done more quickly as opposed to uh, scrambling to get it done really fast, potentially making mistakes and then having to double back and clean up those mistakes. So, uh, you know, I think it's yeah. like this is a thing. And that's an excellent expression. I think it's a kind of a, a leadership point that people should really pay close attention to, because I think also there's a notion of, of drilling and, and preparing for these using muscle memory. And that's what struck me about this story. I mean, these people are working really hard and mistakes can get made. And of course, that's what reverberates around. And we're thinking about the protection of the brand as well. So yeah, I, I, I feel for them, but it, it's a really good lesson, I believe, people to take advantage of just what other people have experienced to justify perhaps the cost and the time involved in preparing and planning for these kinds of things. So moving on to another story we have here, which is about TikTok. And uh, they are quietly updating their privacy policy to collect users' biometric data. This is data such as face prints and voice prints from the content that users post on the platform. Um, they're saying they're couching this in being for uh, other things like uh, demographic classification and ad customization and so on. But basically, unless your country or state has pre-existing laws pre- uh, preventing against this, uh, your agreement to the terms of service uh, puts you in uh, in line to have this collected. So this, to me, um, sounds like a hacker's delight. What's your take on uh, we're using this for free as usual? So what's your take on giving away your face and your voice? I mean, isn't this always the uh, the case with the uh, you know the, the we're giving away all of this data for you know for our benefit, so to speak, uh, you know for for ad personalization and make our lives easier, et cetera, et cetera. 
and you know, and the, and the, the you pay the piper much much farther on down the road. So I mean, this this to me sounds uh, you know is 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 almost just bananas. Um, and but it but it's also not super surprising. And uh, you know you know what I find most one of the things I find most surprising about this is that you know a, a year or two ago there was uh, there's this huge push around. Uh, you know, consumer data privacy laws, you know, GDPR and CCPA. And there was this big frenzy of activity and organizations were kind of, uh, you know, reorganizing themselves to to clean up their privacy policies and be more transparent, have more uh, mechanisms to to uh, be good stewards of, of, of user data. And, and at the same time, some organizations just sort of just sort of fly in the face of that. And uh, and, and we kind of have just moved past the uh, it, it seems in some ways move past the, uh, the, the initial, uh, spark of a reaction to those big consumer data privacy laws, which is, which is really unfortunate because, uh, this stuff is, you know, you know I, I, I could see this being, uh, uh, quasi disastrous down the road. Spark of reaction. Absolutely. These things are so exciting to be part of, you know, whether it's TikTok or anything else. So it's, uh, indeed, we are, we are giving away a lot in exchange for this kind of fun. So we have the uh, story of the month basically being Colonial Pipeline and the ransom there. And the, the notion that uh, basically the U.S. recovered a lot of the money that was apparently paid. Uh, this was um, not the entire amount and the actual ma- the full announcement is supposed to come out on Monday. But it does appear that they uh, paid or got the ransom back in large amount. Uh, And that was because they were able to track down the path, basically, of the money, the money trail, even though it was a cryptocurrency wallet trail. The interesting thing about this is that they said that, uh, basically, you can't really count on this happening every single time the same way. It depends entirely on the context and the situation of the actual um, ransomware people themselves. But it does still appear to be an interesting development. Um, how do you think this might force ransomware pirates to step up their extortion game even further, knowing that maybe governments, not just the U.S. government, but governments maybe have a stronger track on what they're doing? I think, I think the most interesting thing to me about this is that it changes the, it changes the calculus, uh, like the, the economic calculus for a uh, criminal organization uh, who... who Orients towards using ransomware as their as their method to uh, to extract uh, you know financial gain of some sort. So uh, you know it, I think I think it was it was almost largely considered a given that you were going to get some kind of uh, you know some kind of traction, or you had a, a, you had extremely high confidence that uh, you were going to uh, you were going to extract a ransom, especially if you went after a high profile target. Um, but but now you know knowing that. You know, a you may not get paid up in the first place, and even if you do get paid, you could you know that that could end up uh, uh, you know getting um, getting recovered, and and if it gets recovered, you're also very likely you know you're you're very close to law enforcement at that point, and you know as somebody who's who's operating on the on the wrong side of the uh, wrong side of the law is not is probably not a very comfortable situation. So so I think it uh, you know security being this big game of economics. Uh, you know, this this to me is really exciting and really uh, interesting. And, you know, bravo to the, you know, to the Department of Justice on this one. It certainly should give them a little bit pause for thought that, you know, maybe they're not quite as invincible as they seem when it comes to hiding everything inside crypto, uh, that there are some smart people on the good guys side, too. So it definitely is intriguing. But I think also I'm, I'm always looking at the, the constant uh, tradition of innovation that they have to see what comes next. Uh, but while we're speaking about economics, I want to just talk about the, the sort of the story of the last couple of days, which was uh, the, the outage at Fastly. You know, Fastly is a content delivery network, of course, but some of the names that went down, even temporarily, Stack Overflow, Twitch, Reddit, CNN, Amazon, Shopify, the BBC even, uh, they went down for a while. Their browsers or your browser could not pull the page together. Um, 
It wasn't such a, a long outage, but my question to you is that Fastly has described this as a global CDN disruption. Okay, fair enough. But what does this say about the, the bottlenecks on the system? I mean, the internet was supposed to be a centerless web. Uh, and we're now seeing, of course, these providers, which are, they do great service, there's no question about it, but it does appear that this, once again, may be an Achilles heel that could be exploited. So what, what does this say to you about the potential for bottlenecks, not just only at Fastly, of course, but just as part of being on the internet? So, so... In, in a couple of weeks ago, there was this uh, executive order that came out in uh, orienting around cybersecurity, and a big part of that had to do with uh, uh, with supply chain risk management. And you know, the you know, this to me speaks directly to uh, to a supply chain issue. So, uh, you know, when we, for example, look at uh, you know a particular provider, you're not just looking at the provider; you're looking at what's behind the provider. So, for example. Uh, you know, when Amazon Web Services uh, or Azure, you know, one of the big infrastructure the service providers have an issue, you know, they have a regional issue or something, there's this huge cascading effect and nobody really thinks about it because the uptime is so good. But when it's when it's bad or when they have a blip, it's, you know, it's really it's really disruptive. And, you know, can you can stop work for an entire day. And if you have mission critical systems that are reliant and don't have a failover, you know, that it's this whole it's this whole thing. So. Uh, so to me, it's, uh, you know, it's it sort of it, it, it encourages us to to think beyond the initial provider, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, somebody hosting your source code, somebody doing your security scanning, somebody, you know, serving your news or, you know, whatever it happens to be uh, to look beyond them and figure out where there's, um, you know, bottlenecks or, or choke points in terms of, uh, you know, shared shared dependencies. So, you know, are they all sort of. Uh, bundled on, you know, some, uh, an organization like Fastly, uh, you know, again, great organization or Amazon Web Services, great organization, but, you know, nobody is impervious to, uh, to error or, or just, uh, you know, crazy issues happening. It's, it's, it's not, you know, anybody's necessarily fault. Uh, that things happen. No, it's a, it's a good lesson in contingency planning. These are great yeah. companies, but I think you know we we learn these as we go along. But uh, having Plan B or or an alternate Plan A uh, may be a good thing. Maybe they do have it. I mean, the story will come out, of course. But I think it's something we all need to learn as we go. So, our sponsor for this week is Trend Micro. If you want to discover new ways to simplify and strengthen your security, well, join Trend Micro Perspectives on June 16th, where industry experts and practitioners are going to share deep insights and real-world examples on how security can play a pivotal role in accelerating your digital transformation. There'll be speakers from Gartner, Forrester, ESG, AWS, and Microsoft, and you can join by simply visiting trendmicro.com forward slash perspectives to register. I highly recommend it. So we are back. The uh, phishing problem continues. This is something that I ask guests every week and uh, do so in my professional practice also in terms of understanding the human nature behind why phishing always catches people. A new report from Fish Labs has identified that there's 47% uptick in phishing sites in Q1 of this year as compared to the last year at this time. The trend is continuing year over year with uh, the phishing traps now happening in social media messaging apps. That's the time, first time it has topped the list. And also, um, the, the single sign-on approaches too are heavily targeted. Uh, this is accounting now single sign-on for forty percent of overall phishing volume. So this seems to be a constant problem. The human weakness becomes the primary weakness of security online. So do you see, or have you seen anything that could be a potential solution to slow down this problem, Robert? So, so I mean, there's a lot of solutions to to phishing uh, and social engineering in my opinion, you know, none of them are perfect. I, I think a big part of this, um, you know, I don't, I don't love the phrasing of, uh, you know, human, human weakness or humans being at fault in a lot of cases. Cause I, I think humans, uh, you know, we, 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 we sort of adapt to, you know, these, these sort of systems and processes and technologies that we're used to using. It's like, uh, you know, I, I, I have lots of conversations with people uh, at, at my place of work about this where, you know, people might be getting hundreds, 200, uh, you know, a thousand emails a day. And, you know, and the, and the advice of 
make sure you're reviewing every single email and look at all the links and make sure that it's coming from the right place. And, you know, even if you were to add 30 extra seconds of, of critical thinking to every email, you know, they'd be spending a week uh, just, you know, just looking at their email and never do anything else. And so, uh, you know, I, th I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a, there's more responsibility that needs to be put on uh, platforms that are being used for potential abuse or organizations that are uh, designing uh, business processes or, or offering systems that are, that are allowing phishing attacks to come through as easily and, and to allow people to make mistakes as easily as they, uh, as they do. And I think we need to, we need to be thinking in a, in a more human centered design uh, approach such that it is, it is harder to make a mistake. It is harder to have these things be presented to you in the first place and, and just effectively try to take the, the sort of uh, the, the decision burden off the end user, uh, whether they're in an organization or they're just, you know, John Q public consumer. Um, and, and, uh, and it, because, because there is a decision fatigue that happens and, and, you know, we like to say security is everyone's responsibility, but not everyone is hired with security in their response and their job title. Not everyone's, um, you know, performance on security. You know, security isn't really everyone's job, even though we all do have a part to play. And so so we as security professionals across the industry need to be making things easier for, you know, both organ uh, users in our organization and, and users in the in the broader sense. If you're you know working in some kind of consumer consumer oriented model. I wonder if this is a job for AI in terms of, of uh, assessing the, the, the actual construction of the text and the verbiage uh, to, uh, to make things easier. Let's hold that thought because uh, the last story is related to that as well. But before we get there, just uh, related, I think, and also in terms of, of uh, working in an emergency, there was a survey that came out from a, um, a mobile safety organization, Rave Mobile Survey, talking about how many workers still don't know emergency procedures. This is a workplace safety and preparedness survey, which again can focus on all kinds of things. Things, not just simply cyber, of course, but the fact is that only 28% of traveling and remote and remote workers are involved with safety drills. So once again, this need perhaps for proactive safety drills, cyber attacks, yes, but also things like active shooter, workplace violence. Uh, there just seems to be that a lot of people aren't yet being sufficiently uh, tested, prepared for this in the age groups uh, that would deal, let's say, with, again, messaging technologies or something that appeals directly to them. So we touched on this before, but do you think that we're now, as we're looking into the, the new normal people working in the hybrid situation at home, but also in the office, uh, we should really place heavier emphasis on physical muscle memory training for emergencies? I think I th there is definitely an element of that. Uh, I, I totally agree. I think we also need to, you know, almost similar to the, uh, to the previous story, we need to be making things easier for end users. So, uh, for example, I, I just wrapped up finishing this book, which I'll, I'll plug here. The, it's the uh, Ministry of Common Sense. And, and there was a great example that I'm, I'm just going to totally plagiarize and give credit to <laughs> uh, in it that, that referred to, to fire, uh, fire exit um, signs. So typically they're placed you know, above doors in these big bright letters, uh, big bright red letters. And, and the, you know, as, it, as it started to analyze this, this particular example, you know, if a fire happens and somebody's actually trying to find an exit, you know, smoke is going to rise. It's going to be harder to see those signs and people are going to fall to their bellies and be crawling around trying to find things. And so the last thing they're going to see is the fire exit sign above a door. And so so I was analyzing this as a, as a you know, sort of a typical procedure that's just been sort of uh, assumed as common sense. And so we do fire drills and we look for the exit signs and all of that. And so there's an element of common sense um, in, or muscle memory in the sense that, uh, you know, if you do it enough, you'll kind of know your way around a building. But if you're a guest in the building, you know, you may have no idea if a fire happens. And so, so I think there's a, there's a balance there in finding, uh, finding and designing procedures such that they're, they're easy to follow and they, they, you know, they just, they, they're more of a natural um, they're more, more of a natural reaction if things do go, uh, do go awry. Which, of course, I mean, that's not easy to do, but. It's one of the things. 
It, it's not. And it's one of the things that I, I teach people a lot. I mean, when we go back to traveling in hotels once again, uh, the two things I teach people about staying in a hotel is number one, to count the number of doorway entrances between your room and the stairwell. You know, how many actual physical doorway entrances. And secondly, yeah, book hotels where they have those exit line exit signs on the floor. A lot of them in Europe do for that very reason. If you're crawling in a smoke-filled hallway, the sign should be down there on the ground with you. Now, we are very quickly running out of time. It, it, I'm having such fun with you here, and it's it's uh, such great commentary. Uh, I just want to get a real fast comment on our last story, which is about, uh, this is coming up in tomorrow's Nudecast, um, Google fixing the sixth Chrome Zero Day exploited in the wild this year, uh, which makes me nostalgic for concepts like Patch Tuesday. It seems that there are more and more fixes that have to be done out of band by Google and Microsoft and others uh, more regularly. So do you think this, again, is another trend? Trend that we're going to be much more focused on on patches on a daily or hourly basis going forward. I think so. I think I think patching cycles and, and the historical sort of uh, like monthly cadence, where you know you receive a patch, uh, test a patch, deploy a patch, monitor, and and then rinse and repeat. I think a, a lot of security um, you know up, security process is going to have to become much more fluid. Because mm-hmm. things are changing so rapidly, especially with you know browser patches or other software patches, these things are just they just happen asynchronously. They're not they're not waiting for you know some big drop on a you know on a patch Tuesday or on a on a specific date or time of month. It's just you know when they need to happen, they happen, and you just have to be ready to respond. So organizations have to kind of you know they've got to adapt and be more. Uh, be more be more uh, flexible. This risk window is getting smaller and smaller. Well, Robert, this has been uh, amazing, fantastic. I'm just curious to know, was there any particular one of our stories here today that was a favorite for you, either as an eye roller or a thumbs up? What, what stood out for you tonight? I think I would give two thumbs up to the ransomware recovery for Colonial. Uh, you know, I think that is that's a really fascinating development in the in the whole spectrum of uh, ransomware uh, resiliency and recovery efforts for organizations. And, you know, I just want to say, uh, you know, two thumbs up and applause to, uh, my, uh, my peers over in the DOJ and, um, yeah, you know, stay safe out there. Yeah, they're, they're, I think they're calling you. Uh, so fantastic. I usually, I will ask my guests what they would like to have as their, um, uh, their sort of call to action. But um, I would like you, I would like to basically introduce it myself. You have the coolest LinkedIn ID I have ever seen. Thank so, you. I mean, <laughs> we have holy, holy cyber Batman at LinkedIn is where you can reach Robert. I think that is absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for joining me today. This has been so enlightening and I really appreciate your wisdom and your insight. So thanks for being with us on the show today. You are very welcome. This was fun. Well, we are coming to the end once again of another great show, or at least I think it was. I just love learning things from our experts, especially when Batman is actually hanging around in the background. Um, to learn more, join us tomorrow. Our uh, video chat tomorrow is Hacking Acceptable Risk, an hour of critical thinking on when we should stop trying to reduce risk, which is a uh, very appropriate and timely commentary based on what we've just been learning. And remember also, you can reach us. You can listen to us every weekday. Our six-minute podcast, Cybersecurity Headlines, will give you the information that you need to know to get into your day and know what's important and what's going on out there. So I will be back next week. I thank you very much for joining us. Stay safe. Take care. See you soon. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 